So welcome to Cardiovascular Imaging Ground Rounds. My name is Mike Steigner. I'm a cardiovascular radiologist. Today we're going to talk about cardiac masses. I apologize of my voice. I'm a little bit um, under the weather. So I'll try to make it through this presentation without coughing, but I'm sure I'm going to be successful. So learning objectives, we're going to look at all the different imaging modalities that are used for cardiac masses, look at pros and cons. We'll review some of the cardiac CT and cardiac MRI protocols. And then we'll review imaging features of common, uncommon, and uh, just one of the rare cardiac masses. I have no financial disclosures. I don't have a specific slide for that. So there's multiple imaging modalities. Um, first, we'll go up to the third floor for echocardiography. So pros of echocardiography, echo is the first line imaging modality for virtually all of cardiac imaging outside of EKG. It's very widely available, so we have it in ho every hospital throughout the country. ECHO is great for determining the mobility of mass and connection to adjacent structures and how it may might affect the function, including valves. There's also no potentially toxic contrast material that's used with ECHO. We don't routinely use ECHO, but for cardiac masses and filling defects, it's helpful to use an echogenic contrast to sort of outline the mass from the wall. Typically that's done with agitated saline. There's no radiation exposure. So echo is just ultrasound, and ultrasound doesn't cause any damage at diagnostic um, radiation levels. There's also very high temporal resolution. So temporal resolution of echo is somewhere between 15 and 20 milliseconds, which is about two to three times as good as cardiac MRI. And the spatial resolution is quite good as well. You can also use echo to guide biopsy of cardiac tumors in the OR and also with the use of 3D TEE. Some of the cons is that the windows can be limited in obese patients or patients with poor acoustic windows. So we may not see, for example, the extent of involvement of the apex or the lateral wall of the right ventricle. Also, the 3D capabilities are limited, so we don't routinely get a 3D reconstructed volume that we can cut and slice however we want in order to accurately measure a mass, for example. It's very good for the lumen, though. Whenever we're doing 3D, echo is mostly used for, for the lumen evaluation, not really for evaluation of adjacent structures. So really limited to the, to the heart for, for echo. Nuclear imaging, what we're talking about mostly is FDG PET and octreotide imaging. Some of the pros is that we are able to detect metabolic activity, so we can see if a mass is using glucose. We can also detect distant metastasis, so we get whole body imaging, where we can see that there's METs to the lymph nodes or adjacent structures. One of the cons is also metabolic activity. So with normal metabolic activity of the heart, if we're using glucose metabolism and we're trying to look at a mass that's also using glucose, well, we're gonna have a problem so we need to try to suppress the glucose activity when looking for involvement in the myocardium, so shift the, the metabolism of the my, myocytes to fatty acid metabolism by giving the patients bacon, which is the only time you ever get to order bacon for your patients. <laughs> also, it may obscure small lesions, and also we have the problem of bre with brown fat, which is high metabolic fat, um, which can take up FEG. Cardiac CT. So pros of cardiac CT is we get a volumetric data set. We get a full 3D data set that's very high spatial resolution on the order of half a millimeter in all three dimensions. We can cut and slice that data however we want. That allows us to get more accurate tissue characterization. We can also look for vascular invasion because the spatial resolution is so high into the aorta, into the pulmonary artery, or adjacent structures. We can also look for small vessels that are actually feeding the mass. Our ability for functional assessment is limited by the, by the temp resolution of cardiac CT, and I'll show you some examples of that. Cardiac MR definitely has better temp resolution. We can get an idea of functional assessment, um, but it's not, not great compared to MR or echo. Extra cardiac structures is, is great for CT. We get the whole chest or the whole abdomen and pelvis at the same time. That way we can look for METs or invasion. This is also good in patients that are not able to tolerate MRI. For example, the gantry size of the, the gantry, the CT gantry, is about 90 centimeters. Where in MRI, it's the wide bore MRIs are 70 centimeters. So that's a big difference 
So a, a small bore MRI, my shoulders hit the side of the magnet, and I'm kind of a biggish dude. And that's enough to make people claustrophobic. We have patients that can be claustrophobic even in CT, um, but those are really, really severe cases of claustrophobia. But patients aren't able to tolerate MRI for other reasons, um, such as obesity. So if, 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 and I weigh 240 pounds, if you have a 300 pound patient, you're not, they're not gonna be able to actually physically fit in the magnet, because it's not only the person, but you have to strap the coil on top of them as well. So we have to fit that in. And sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't fit. So that's a reason to do CT. Also, the patient has to be able to lie flat for a long period of time for a cardiac MRI. The protocol typically lasts around an hour. So if the patient can't lie flat for 20 minutes, they're not really a candidate for MRI. Or in CT, they're only going to have to lie on the table for five or maximum of 10 minutes. Some of the cons is radiation exposure. Um, this is a theoretical risk. It hasn't been proven that CT or diagnostic radiation causes radiation-induced cancers with diagnostic levels of radiation, but it's still something we think about and we try to give the patients the least amount of exposure possible. Also, there's the potential for contrast-induced nephropathy. This is a topic that's recently been, been debated and the, the literature has shifted on this, but we still talk about it. Also, worst temporal resolution. We talked about this a little bit in the previous slide, and I'll show you an example of that. Next, let's talk about the cardiac CT protocol. So with the cardiac CT protocol, we typically tailor the acquisition to the requirements of the study. So do we need to do an I minus study to look, how does the mass look before contrast? Do we need to do a functional assessment? Do we need the entire cardiac cycle? Do we need to look for delayed enhancement? We also adapt the technique to the patient's body habitus. So we change the amount of photons and the energy of photons that we put into the patient in order to get the image quality that we need. This can be done automatically on almost all of the scanners. And you can also have the ability to adjust, to increase the dose if you're looking at strong, smaller structures or not. We can do either dynamic or prospective acquisition. This depends on whether or not we need a full functional assessment of the heart. So if we look here, this um, gray bar sort of shows the full the full MA throughout the cardiac cycle, and we've applied a little bit of dose reduction to the parts of the cardiac cycle which are not as important. This is a prospective acquisition where we only acquire data during end diastole to limit the radiation dose. Typically, we don't need a full dynamic study as the patients have already had an echo usually, and we have an idea of how the mass is moving throughout the cardiac cycle, but sometimes we do it now that we can do lower dose. Here's an example of, of functional analysis. Here we have a, a mass that's attached to the interatrial septum. So this is classic for a left atrial myxoma, and we'll see this one a little bit later. But notice the, the function of the valve leaflets and the myocardium. If we're looking for valve leaflet function, we, we can be a little bit limited in CT compared to echo or MRI. But we do have the full volume of the heart, so we're able to quantify quite, quite accurately. As for quantification, we only really need end diastole and then end systole, and the heart is not moving as much during those phases, so our limited temporal resolution is able to capture or freeze motion during those two phases, which is why we show compar great comparisons to cardiac MRI with cardiac CT for function. We're allowed to acquire multiple phases, so here's an example of two different cases. So here's a case of a patient that has a, a mass in the inferior um, atrioventricular groove. This is a patient that had a, a bypass graft to the right coronary artery, and this is an aneurysm of that. So in the pre-contrast phase, we see that there's this hyperdensity, which looks like a cute clot, and we see that that doesn't really change after contrast. Here's a different case, but very similar. We see something bright pre-contrast, and this is at the level of the mitral annulus, so this is massive mitral annular calcification, which doesn't enhance post-contrast. So with CT, we have the ability to look at the fat content, calcium, and also whether or not something enhances pre or post contrast. Also, we can potentially acquire coronary CTA at the same time. If the patient's being considered for surgery and they're low risk, we can exclude them for the need of cardio coronary artery bypass grafting during the surgery. And here's an example of a patient that has a, a very tight left main lesion. Cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI has the best tissue characterization of all the modalities, soft tissue assessment. Even without contrast, we have 
very high level of tissue characterization. We can also look at tissue perfusion. We can do first pass and second pass enhancement and also look for delayed enhancement. Functional assessment is pretty good. So here we see that we can see the, the function of the RV. We don't really see any um, blurring of motion throughout the cardiac cycle. Just as an example, here we have a, a large mass in the right atrium. We can look for invasion. We can look at the mobility of the mass with pretty good certainty. We can also look at the compromise of valvular function, extra cardiac structures, and the benefit that there is no ionizing radiation with MRI. There are a couple of downfalls is that the availability is limited. So cardiac MRI is only really offered at tertiary care centers. We don't see this in routine hospitals throughout the country, community hospitals. Not compatible with some implantable devices. We have more and more devices. Even now we have an AICD that's now MRI conditional, up to three Tesla. We scanned our first case of that uh, two weeks ago. Patients with arrhythmias are a problem with cardiac MRI. So most of the tissue characterization and the functional sequences that we acquire, those sequences, each one takes multiple heartbeats to build the image. So if there's any variability in, this, in the length of the RR interval between those different beats, we're going to have blurry motion, which is a problem when we're looking to characterize a match. We want zero motion. Obese patients, we already talked about that. Inability to breath hold or lie flat. So the patients are going to have to do 50 or 60 breath holds at least. Each breath hold can be up to 15 seconds. So typically we try to make the average breath hold about 10 seconds. But if you have a patient on the floor and they have a mass that's affecting their mitral valve, for example, and they can't hold their breath more than five seconds, it's gonna be a problem. We still have some tricks that we can do for patients that can't hold their breath, but the better the patient can breath hold, typically the better quality study we're gonna get. We talked about claustrophobia. Typically patients that are claustrophobic, we do have a, a larger bore magnet that when they fail because of claustrophobia on the small bore, the text usually can get them to tolerate the, the large bore magnet. Um, open MRIs would not give you the adequate spatial resolution, so nobody does cardiac MRI with an open magnet. That's really only for musculoskeletal MRI. Let's review the protocol. So typically the protocol lasts about an hour. Um, that's if we can find the mass pretty quickly. If we can't find the mass, then the protocol can sometimes take a little bit longer. Or if the orientation of the mass is, is a little tricky, then sometimes that can add time to the scan. But really, it shouldn't take longer than an hour. And if we have any imaging before, if the patient has a CT or has an echo, we definitely want to review those images before even protocoling the patient for the MR so we know exactly where we're going to target. We don't want to screen the whole patient's chest if we don't need to because that's gonna add time. So we start off with localizers, then we go into our sending sequences. We wanna answer these questions. We wanna find the mass, look for relationships, look for invasion or adherence of the mass, and also quantify function. Since we're there, we might as well do that. These are a couple standard views that we typically use to, to assess mass. So generally, we want to have two views that are somewhat perpendicular to each other. This is what we call the horizontal long axis stack or the four chamber stack. And this is an example of a mass. The patient here has a pedunculated mass in the RV, and we'll talk about this mass. So I won't give that, give that one away, but we'll talk about it later. Next, we do a short axis stack. So this is our standard short axis quantification stack that we do in every patient that gets a cardiac MRI. And one, one of the things that I'll point out is that this is for standard quantification. When we're trying to look for a relationship of a mass, we may want to increase our spatial resolution and or our temporal resolution to identify those relationships. So these images are eight millimeters thick, but you can go down, and I've gone down to five millimeters pretty easily with this sequence, and that can make a big difference. You can also decrease your segments in order to get better temporal resolution. So there's ways to adjust the sequence to get better temporal resolution. If you're having a hard time figuring out the relationship between the mass and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, so we don't want to just rely on our standard sequence. We're going to use this to find the mass and then hone down in on it and get some really high quality spatial and temporal resolution sequences. We can also do additional views once we know where the mass is. So this is a particular view that we do of the right ventricle. This is called the paraseptal view or the inflow outflow view. And we see the mass here again in the right ventricle. Another sine sequence that's used is called myocardial tagging. 
Here we have an example of grid tagging and line tagging. And tagging was developed to measure myocardial strain and strain rates. And the way that's done is if you look at these radio frequency grid squares that were de deployed onto the myocardium, they measure the deformation of those squares throughout the cardiac cycle, and that's how we get strain and strain rates. We use it in the mass realm to see, are these squares deforming at all? So a mass is not going to contract. But one of the differentials with the focal thickening in the walls is focal HCM, where the HCM muscle will actually contract. So you can use this for your benefit. Also, we want to look for adherence or invasion of the myocardium. And we'll get into that a little bit more specifically, but we'll see a, a large mass here. We're trying to look for separation of these lines throughout the cardiac cycle to see if the mass is connected to that structure or not. Tissue characterization. This is a sequence, there are multiple sequences that are used to identify roughly what are the T1 characteristics, what are the T2 characteristics of the mass. So by doing that, we're trying to identify how much water content there is in the mass, or is there something else that shortens the T1, like blood, or potentially calcification that's not very dense? Or is there fat in the mass? So we can apply fat saturation techniques. So here's an example of a, of a fat sat technique and no fat sat. So we see that the, the fat has saturated or gone black in this case. So that gives us a pretty good idea of what the diagnosis would be. Next, we can do perfusion of the mass. So we can do first pass and even second pass perfusion. And it's Good to make sure that you get about two minutes of perfusion. So either if you're gonna do every heartbeat, you wanna run 120 phases. If your scanner can't do that, you can go every other heartbeat. Let's say if you can only do 60 phases, just do every other heartbeat. Because we're not really looking to separate the perfusion from normal myocardium in this case. We're looking at the perfusion characteristics of the mass itself. So we don't really need very great or very fine separation between normal and abnormal myocardium here. What's important to see, is there any perfusion? When does that perfusion happen? Is it early or is it late? So that's really what we're looking for here. And if we look at this mass here, it pretty much stays dark. Um, if I zoomed in on it, maybe there's a, a hint of some late second path perfusion. We, we can also do volumetric 3D imaging. So we can require images of the entire chest. So here we have a, a patient that has um, nodular pleural thickening, which is enhancing. So this is pre-contrast, post-contrast. And this, is, this was a breast cancer patient, but we can see this in lung cancer patients as well. So we get an idea of what's the involvement of the rest of the chest. We can also do volumetric 3D imaging of the heart in cardiac MRI, um, the so-called long TI navigator that we've been doing recently. And that's great for quantification of the mass, where we are not limited to the planes where the image is acquired in. We can cut and slice it however we see fit in order to accurately measure the mass and also compare it on post-therapy imaging. Delayed enhancement, so we want to see is there contrast being retained in the mass, um, similar to the way we look for contrast being retained in scar or fibrosis, for example, in patients um, post-MI. So here's an example of that. We'll see a little bit of enhancement in this mass late. So it should be an hour. That's the goal is to be less than an hour if we can. But sometimes it doesn't uh, doesn't always work out. So let's zoom out a little bit. And th this is a, a, a nice little cartoon that I made of a, of a bucket. And so uh, eventually a lot of masses sort of end up in the bucket, so from the OR. And we bend these into different um, frequencies. So we have more the more common masses up at the top, some more uncommon masses, and some of the rare masses. We're going to focus on the more common masses, which would be thrombus, met, METs, Obviously, myxoma, pericardial cysts, lipomas, lipomatous hypertrophy, fibroelastoma. Some of the un more uncommon masses, but ones that are very important, angiosarcoma, lymphoma, and fibromas. And then one of the, with the more rare ones that we see, which we have some, a good case of, paraganglioma. So um, Raymond Kwong, he's our director of cardiac MRI. He has a, a this is the first edition of his book on cardiac MRI, but the second edition um, Dr. Ayaz Agayev, who's graced his presence uh, here today, has come up with this chart, which I, I helped him basically just color code, but he put the whole thing together himself. And this is, will be in the second edition of the book, but if anybody wants a copy, we can send you the PDF of this. This is a great chart when you can't remember all of the different specifics for different masses, 
This gives you the morphology, the locations, and I know this is busy and the point is not to, to read this whole thing right now. The function of the mass, the tissue characterization, T1, T2, whether it saturates with fat saturation, and also post-contrast, so first pass perfusion and late gadolinium enhancement. And I, I find it difficult to keep all of these in my short-term memory, so this is, this is great for, for reference. We have benign masses, malignant, and there's others than, than are listed here, but these are the most common ones, and also the characteristics of some non-neoplastic mass-like structures. Okay, so first we'll start with thrombus. So this was a, a nice paper by the group at Duke where they looked at detection of left ventricular thrombus by delayed enhancements. So here what they did is they looked at 784 patients with systolic dysfunction and looked at the prevalence of thrombus in those patients. They compared the CINE images to the detection by delayed enhancement images and delayed enhancement showed 7%, CINE showed only 4.7% and you don't want to miss any patient with a thrombus in the LV because they're a stroke risk. Here's an example of a concordant study. So here's our CINE-MR sequence. This is our delayed enhancement sequence. And this is the, the long TI. So this group um, did a good job des describing this sequence to, to use for looking for thrombus in the LV. And the, with the long inversion time imaging, and we won't go into the technique of that, but the thrombus will stay pretty much jet black. But everything else that has GAD in it will continue to recover signal. So here we see a concordant example. Next we have a discordant example, where if you look at this CINE MRI, huh, I, 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 would be, I think all of us would be hard pressed to say there's thrombus on this image. But if we look at the long TI delayed enhancement sequence, it's pretty easy to see this black limb. And that was the point of the study, to show that we're missing people by just using CINE MR. They also looked at the prevalence of thrombus in ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. Ischemic has a higher prevalence, the thought being that, that there's an inflammatory process with ischemic patients, and that leads to thrombus more frequently than in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, where just the slow flow is leading to thrombus. So delayed enhancement, um, CMR for the detection of thrombus is definitely better. Can be limited with neural thrombus and with scars and independent risk factor. And the main takeaway that I took from this paper was to use the long TI imaging in every patient that has a cardiomyopathy to make sure that you're not going to miss a thrombus. And we do this routinely now, even if you're going to do a whole heart, but you want to look at the entire heart, not just one slice, because you may not be cutting through the right slice. So you have to do a whole heart evaluation, and we can do that in about 30 seconds. So it's not a big deal to add that sequence at the end of your study. Next, we'll talk about metastatic disease. So here's a nice paper from Pam Woodard's group at uh, Wash U. So here we looked at METs being uh, much more common than primary cardiac tumors. It's about a 20 to 1 prevalence. Some studies say it's 100 to 1. And in patients with malignant neoplasms diagnosed of those patients, cardiac METs was found in about 10% of people. If we look at the most common tumors that we see METs in the heart, these are going to be the most common tumors that we see in all patients. So lung and breast being the two most common. If we look at the tumor that most frequently metastasizes to the heart, that's going to be melanoma. And so that the way that the question is worded, um, you have to pay attention to that when you're answering this question in a written exam, for example. Other ones that are pretty common that we'll, we'll show examples of is renal. Here we see a, a, a nasty renal cell cancer. Mesothelioma based on proximity. So mesothelioma is not a common tumor, but it very commonly can metastasize into adjacent structures. And here's an example of that where we see the circumferential rim here. And then lymphoma. So here's a PET showing very avid uptake of basically every lymph node in the patients. And we also see uptake in the spleen. So this is a known high school lymphoma. Okay, so let's look at some case examples. Here we have a, a mass which is invading the right inferior pulmonary vein. And if we look adjacent to that, to that, we see a large mass in the right lung. So this is a pretty easy diagnosis. This is a lung cancer invading the right inferior pulmonary vein. Here's an example of a, a patient that has metastatic disease involving the pericardium. 
So we see that on multiple views. And the question that was asked of us is, is this invading the heart? And here's where we use that tagging, those tagging sequences, and we're looking for the breakage of these lines. So normally these lines should break and slide across one another. So we, we could say, and we probably didn't need tagging on this, we could say from the SSFP that it's not invading the heart. But this was a, a breast cancer with pericardial mets with no invasion. Here's another case of a, a met involving the myocardium. So on the top panel we have T1, we have T2, so it's bright on T1. So pre-contrast T1 without fat sat, we have that it's bright. We have T2 here with fat sat, it's also bright. SSFP is sort of a mixture of T2 over T1, square root of that, and on gadolinium enhancement, we see a little bit of enhancement here. So based on the brightness of the T1, we know that melanoma shortens the T1. So it's one of the only tumors that's bright on T1 without GAD. Here's another example of a metastatic melanoma. Melanoma, we see a large mass involving the right atrium. Here's another mass in the lung. So melanoma is, is nasty in a hematogenous spread. That's why we see it in lots of places where we don't see other tumors because it um, goes everywhere throughout the bloodstream. Here's an example of a, a renal cell cancer. So we see, um, it's kind of hard to see the, the renal cell cancer here, but what we do see is the IVC. So normally the, these are black blood images. So the, the blood pool of the arteries and veins, so here's a hepatic vein, should be black. And here we see the IVC is essentially filled with soft tissue. And that's extending up into the right atrium. And this is a very common pathway that we'll see of renal cell cancers. And it's important to, to delineate if this extends into the right atrium or not, because that will change the surgical approach from a chest approach to an abdomen approach in these patients. Here's an example of a lymphoma involving the pericardial space. So we see this extremely thickened pericardium. We also see involvement of the pleural space. So this was a T-cell lymphoma in a 32-year-old woman. Here's a, a case from our institution where we see this mass sort of centered on the pericardial space. Don't really see any, any involvement of the pleura or adjacent structures. This ended up being a primary pericardial mesothelioma. And the question for us, and th these, are, these images are image chest MRI images, so they weren't cardiac MRI specific. And the easy way to tell the difference is that these are standard radiology planes, so axial, coronal, sagittal, not four chamber views, short axis views. So they wanted to look for adherence or invasion, so we did a cardiac MRI. And here we see, we're looking for these lines sort of separating. Kind of what we, what we want to see is this, but we don't see that, so they just stay stuck. So this is at least inherent, possibly invaded into the myocardium. And that was a primary pericardial mesothelioma. This is a cool one, even though that's so striking. This is a non-contrast CT. And this is a patient that has metastatic disease. So what tumor would calcify to this extent? This is an osteosarcoma in a 17-year-old. So all of this is calcium from the tumor, laying down calcium. Next, we'll move to a another benign mass of the heart, the pericardial cyst. So pericardial and bronchogenic cysts may compress the heart and mimic a cardiac mass. Some patients actually present with pain. Um, even if you drain them, they can recur and patients have pain. We have one, one patient that's like that. These are congenital. Typically, they're seen at the right cardiophrenic angle. I'll show you two cases of that. Typically, they're unilocular, contain water-based fluid without internal septum. The fluid is typically simple, these do not enhance, but they can contain some proteinaceous fluid which can affect the signal. Also, one of the things that's important is that, and we'll see from the, the images, is that pulsation can affect the, the signal characteristics. So it's important to, to look for that. So because they can have mixed um, contents, that can affect the T2 and the T1 weighting. So here's an example of one of our cases. So we have the Cine, the bright blood Cine images. These are SSFP. We see this relatively bright structure in the right cardiophrenic angle. Our T1 black blood images, double inversion recovery, where the blood pool is black. This is weighted for T1. We see the CSF, which is the stuff around the cord, is black, and that's fluid, so we know that this is T1 weighted. And we see that this is hypo-intense relative to the myocardium. And we want to talk relative to the myocardium when talking about cardiac masses. 
And if you were in the outside of the heart, you would go relative to skeletal muscle. This is an internal control for soft tissue. Here's our delayed enhancement sequence where we don't see any delayed enhancement of the mass. And this is our first and second pass perfusion where we don't see any filling of the internal contents of the structure. Here's a case from the literature. This one is nice that it shows the T2 homogeneous and or homogeneous signal intensity being increased on T2, again, at the right cardiophrenic angle. So bronchogenic cysts are another cyst that we can see in the region of the heart. These are congenital. They come from the bronchopulmonary foregut. Typically, these are diagnosed by the, the chest radiologist because it's found in the region of the carina. These are lined with secretory epithelium, which can be a mixture of water and proteinaceous mucus, and that can affect the signal. You can also have hemorrhage and calcification, so you can, can have heterogeneous signal. But the, the key feature is that these are not going to enhance. So heterogeneous on T2, T1 and T2, you can have fluid fluid levels with denser, more proteinaceous fluid or hemorrhage being in these. This is an example of one that was found on a chest x-ray. So we see a mass that's sort of splaying the carina. So that's a great location for this. And on the cardiac MRI, we see homogeneous high signal in T2. Very classic location. Here's another example here. We have a photomicrograph which shows the respiratory epithelium for all the pathologists in the audience or people that are trying to remember back to what respiratory epithelium looked like in, in uh, histo. I certainly didn't. Myxoma. So this is a nice review of 83 patients from the AFIP where they looked at imaging features for cardiac myxomas. So cardiac myxoma is a benign neoplasm, and this is the most common benign primary tumor of the heart. So it's typically found as an intracavitary left atrial mass that arises from the interatrial septum, but it can come from any cardiac chamber. Most cases occur sporadically. Most affected patients present with at least one feature of a classically described triad, which includes obstructive symptoms, constitutional symptoms, and embolic events. If we look at the tumor location for this series, just about a little more than half of these were left atrial. Most of the rest of them were right atrial, but then we see other chambers were also involved, and I'll show you an example of that. The carny complex, this is familial recurrent atrial myxoma. So we're not going to dive too deep into what this is and all the clinical features, but I just wanted to, to share with you. So patients have familial recurrent myxomas, pigmented skin lesions, schwannomas, myocutaneous myxomas, and various endocrinal overactivity and neoplasms. And this is the clinical criteria, which is too, uh, too busy for us to go through now. If we look at the photomicrograph of a myxoma, we see a lot of chemosyter-laden macrophages, so myxomas can hemorrhage. We can also see calcification in myxomas, and that's going to give us a hint as to what the signal characteristics should be. So based on that, we can see basically heterogeneous signal on T1. Um, we also see a lot of connective tissue spaces in here, which is going to lead to the high T2 signal. So they have a relatively high water content. So they should be pretty high on T2-weighted images. I'll show you a, a couple of case examples. So this first one is from um, Orla Buckley. She was she's my first fellow. Um, shout out to the Irish people. She was an Irish fellow. She was great. Here we have an example of a, a mass here on cardiac CT. We do see some calcification of the mass. This is in the right atrium. On MRI, we have T1 and T2 weighted images, and we see heterogeneous signal on both. And that's because of that varying amounts of hemorrhage and calcification. We see the mass here just as an intracavitary mass on echocardiography. Here's a different patient. Here we have a dynamic contrast enhanced CT. This is the same image we showed earlier, showing a pedunculated mass from the inner atrial septum. This is a pretty classic location. And this is the gross specimen here. We see the heterogeneous signal here on CT. Some of that is going to be enhancement. Some of that is some calcification. Here's another case. This is a patient that presented with symptoms. So here we have a patient with obstructive symptoms at that. We have a large right atrial mass. Looks almost identical to that other one, actually, with this focal calcification in almost the same place. Here we have another CT that was taken at a different time point than this one. And notice that the mass is now prolapsed into the right ventricle. And this was the cause of the patient's symptoms. This, and you can see the size of the right atrium being huge here. 
And if we look at the liver, we see, well, first of all, we see massive ascites, and then we see this sort of mottled speckled appearance of the liver. This is what we call nutmeg liver, and that's consistent with cardiac cirrhosis from obstruction. And we see this hemorrhagic sort of um, heterogeneous mass on the gross specimen. And this was a, another myxoma. We also have the pleural effusion there, so an, an obstructing mass. Here's another case. Um, this was found on echocardiography. We see this um, highly mobile mass in the distal right ventricle. Here we see our long axis view, our four chamber stack, where we see the mass there again. If we look at our tissue characterization sequences, we have T1, we have T2, so pretty homogeneous on T1. It looks to be a little bit brighter on T2. This is our T1 post contrast enhancement. Kind of tough to say whether this is enhancing relative to that. Image quality is not great here. Here's our first pass perfusion. Maybe at the very tail end, we start to see a little bit of white speckles show up sort of towards the center of the mass, and that would be consistent with the myxoma. So late perfusion. On delayed enhancement, we see some heterogeneous delayed enhancement of the mass. So only 7% occur in the right ventricle. Um, so I've only, this is the only case that I've ever seen in the right ventricle, so they're not, not very common. Next, we'll talk about fibrolastoma. Fibrolastoma is the, the second most common benign tumor. So it's a collection of avascular fronds of dense connective tissue lined by epithelium. Some authors believe this is reactive. Other people believe it's a hematoma. This is still debated. So second most common primary tumor after myxoma. Typically, patients present with um, symptoms from embolization. This can be embolization of the mass itself or thrombus that happens in those throm in those fronds that then embolizes. These are typically small masses, and a centimeter is about as big as I've ever seen, and that makes it difficult for us to characterize the tissue on cardiac MRI. And I'll show you some examples of that. Have been reported as large as five centimeters. I haven't seen one that big. Often likened to a sea anemone, and I'll show you a picture of a gross specimen which looks like that. Over 90% occur on valve surfaces, but they can occur on the wall of the aorta. We have a case of that on, the, on aortic valves being the most common. Here we have 16% of what can arise from the wall of any endocardial surface, so keep that in mind. And your differential, of course, small pedunculated mass. Here's a review from a, a group in Korea where they showed a nice gross specimen of the mass. Here, you can see the, you can sort of imagine this is a an enemy that's sort of hanging upside down. And we can see these collagenous bands. So because of the relatively high water content and the presence of water in and around those fronds that's not moving in and out of plane, when we do our double inversion recovery images, our dark blood images, we're going to see bright signal of this mass. Some of that may be slow flow next to the mass. Here's an example of one. These are our bright blood images, the SSFP. Here's an example of the mass on T2. This is the only example I can find of this in T2. We have never had a mass even this big that we could get an adequate T2 image of, or I haven't seen one yet. Um, but this is, you know, if that's right on T2, maybe. Um, but this is the, the only example I could find, so I figured I would show it to you. Here's an example of a, this is the largest one that, that I have seen. We don't have cardiac MR images of this one. Um, this was a large fibroblastoma that was picked up. I think the patient presented with a TIA. The mass was found on echo. We can see this large mass emanating from the coronary cusp. And notice the proximity to the coronary ostium. And if you look at the CT images, this is a 3D volume rendered image showing the proximity to the coronary ostium. And this was an issue because they didn't want to catheterize the patients for pre-op clearance of coronary artery disease because they didn't want to go in with a big catheter and knock off part of the mass or the thrombus that was attached to the mass and end up with a stroke. So because the patient was low risk for coronary artery disease, we went for CT, and we did find actually that there was some potentially obstructive plaque in the LED, and they bypassed this lesion based on the CT findings because they did not want to go to cath. The patient did well. Next, we'll talk about lipoma. So lipoma, 
of primary cardiac tumors of mature adipose tissue. Because they're mature fat cells, they should have the same characteristics as any other fat that you can see in the body. So here's an example of one here affecting the right atrium. And notice the signal characteristics here. This is a CT. So the density is the same as mediastinal fat and subcutaneous fat. And that's going to control <coughs> excuse me, what we see on cardiac MRI. There has been an association with arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation and V-fib and AV block. There's a few reported cases in patients with tub tubular sclerosis having multiple cardiac lipomas. Here's an example from, from Orla's paper, the same paper, showing a cardiac CT. This is post-contrast, showing no enhancement of the fat. Also, the density is the same as the mediastinal and epicardial fat that we can see here. We also have a little bit of fat um, surrounding the aorta. So if that's basically the exact same density. Here's our T1 double inversion recovery. So CSF, the ring around the cord there, is black. The blood pool is black, so double inversion recovery. T1 rated. So it's a little bit bright, brighter on than myocardium on T1. And on this is a, a T2 weighted image, but there is fat sat, and we see that this completely saturates with fat saturation, and that's diagnostic of the lipoma. Lipomonous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum. This one is a little bit peculiar. Um, so this is also debated as, as what the etiology of this is. So some people believe that this is an, actually a neoplastic lesion, where others believe this is just anomalous development. First identified in 1964 at autopsy. Even though the mass is typically asymptomatic, it has been associated with arrhythmias and sudden death. In rare patients who experience intractable sy symptoms, you can actually have um, obstruction of the SVC with this. You can consider surgical excision. This is a prospective study that looked at 1,292 consecutive patients to look at the frequency of lipomonous hypertrophy, and they described it as 2.2%, um, which, in, in my experience, I think that's pretty low. I think it just wasn't really recognized as this. I think we see this much more frequently than 2% than of cases. And usually the patients that are bigger, that bigger meaning having more subcutaneous fat, they also have more mediastinal fat, more epicardial fat, they also have more lipomatous hypertrophy, also associated with older patients with, a mean, with 60 to 70 year olds. So let's take a look at the gross findings. So this is a photomicrograph just showing the, the fat deposition here. If we take a look at the imaging, so typically um, in echocardiography, we'll see the septum appears as a bilobar echogenic structure and it always spares the possible valve, so that's the key. And one of the things that you, you may be looking to exclude is lymphoma versus this, and lymphoma will not spare, will not respect any of the borders of the heart. It will cut through these borders. If we look at CT, we're looking for a non-enhancing homogeneous dumbbell-shaped mass with fat attenuation, smooth margins confined to the intraatrial septum, and absent from the fossa ovalis. With MRI, we're basically looking for the same thing, with evidence of fat saturation. So this group provided statistical evidence of a causal association between lipomus hypertrophy and arrhythmias. They described um, this location where two of the pathways between the SA node and the AV node course through the interatrial septum, anterior to the fossa ovalis, with this abnormal P wave configuration, termed dome and dip. Has anybody here ever seen that? Ron or Hish, have you guys ever seen that, this dome and dip thing? No. So typically extension into the SVC and the right atrial inflow um, is not common, but it has been described. So intervention is usually not required as if this is something that's present in, in, you know, at birth that just continues to grow with the patient, we would see the patient compensate for that. But if this is a, um, you know, a neoplastic type of Etiology, then that would explain why the symptoms would happen later in life, potentially. I have yet to see one that's been operated on. So here's a, a case example. This is a, an older case from, from our archives here. If we first look at the CT, we see this dumbbell-shaped fat attenuation. And I apologize that this is not a gated CT, but this is the one that's associated with this case. If we look at our non-fat saturated T1 images, 
Here we clearly see this dumbbell-shaped mass sparing the fossa ovalis, which saturates with fat saturation. And that's diagnostic. And if you look at the size of this patient, there's a lot of subcutaneous fat, mediastinal fat, and then epicardial fat. So I'm not surprised to see lipomus hypertrophy in this patient. Let's look at one of the more uncommon masses, but very important, angiosarcoma. Angiosarcoma is going to be the most common primary cardiac malignancy of adulthood, 37% of all cases. So this is defined as ill-defined anastomotic vascular spaces lined by atypical endothelial cells, typically involves the right atrium. So angiosarcoma is a tumor typically of veins. We don't really see angiosarcomas in arteries. And that's sort of the thinking behind why this involves the right atrium, which is more of a venous-related structure. Typically, they present, present as pseudoaneurysms of the right ventricle. Typically, they present with METs. Um, this is a, a case of a large mass involving the right ventricle, essentially destroying the wall of the right ventricle. We see heterogeneous um, T1, and that could be from hemorrhage in the mass. See, this is T1. We see the dark ring around the CSF here. Um, this is T1 without fat sat, but it's post-contrast. So look at the amount of enhancement that we see here. So angiosarcomas light up like a light bulb. It's a vascular, it's a very vascular tumor and very aggressive. No saturation of fat sat in that case. Here's a case from, from Orla's paper. Again, this one's nice in that we have an angio, which shows you the intense enhancement of this tumor with the neovascular recruitment. Um, this is pretty, pretty amazing. Next, we'll talk about lymphoma. So primary cardiac lymphomas are extremely rare. We have seen a couple here. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common type. These are solid infiltrative masses. They can mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, actually, because you can just see a smooth thickening of the right ventricular free wall, for example. Here we see a case. So here is a, a great example of what I was referring to with, without respecting that fossa ovale. So we should typically start to see some of it here, and we don't. It sort of spans that gap. We see this wall thickening, and this is not fat attenuation. So if this, all of this was lipomatous hypertrophy, this would all be the same color, this black color on soft tissue um, window, and we don't see that. We see that this is a soft tissue um, that's similar to the myocardium or skeletal muscle. So we know that this is soft tissue. It's an infiltrative mass. Here we see on cardiac MR, a high signal intensity on T2. These are typically homogeneous, high signal intensity on T2 weighted images. They do enhance. Here's an example of a case from our series. Um, this is Iaz's case here. So we have bright blood images. We have T1. We have um, T1 post contrast. This is T2, and you can see the homogeneous high signal intensity. Here we see on delayed enhancement that we do see you have to be careful with delayed enhancement that you're, whenever you're looking at a mass, you want to make sure you do long inversion time recovery images because we don't want to know the tumor. So if the mass has the same amount of GAD in it that the myocardium has, and you pick a time that's going to know the myocardium, you could be knowing the mass. So if you do long inversion times, then you're letting anything that has GAD in it completely recover the signal. That'll give us a better idea if we're looking at the extent of enhancement that we see versus a necrotic core, for example. So one of the tendencies would be to say, oh, well, this is just all necrosis and there's no enhancement there. But we know that all of this is enhancing. This is a lymphoma. This is a great example of um, pre and post treatment. So the mass is pretty much indetectable post treatment. <coughs> fibroma. So fibroma is a benign tumor. It's a collection of fibroblasts, um, which is mostly large amounts of collagen. And as we know, collagen is what we're, the increase in collagen is what we're looking for to show delayed enhancement in patients that have had myocardial scar or fibrosis. So that's going to give us a hint as to what we expect this to look like with delayed enhancement images. This is a hamartoma. Primarily affects children, but we do see cases in adults. Um, they are rare. Gorlin syndrome is nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, where you can see uh, multiple fibromas. Here's an example from the literature where we see this um, very dense mass. Here it's bright on echocardiography. 
Here we see this increased wall thickness. This one has two five rungs. There's one here and one here. And it's a little bit um, hyper intense in this example on T1 weighted images, but not, not very much so. They can also calcify. So here we see on non-contrast CT, calcium in the mass. But they, they'll present initially as just wall thickening. So it, it, they require, whenever you have wall thickening on, on an echo, you want to go to another study, typically with MR, to see is that just HCM, is it a mass, what are we looking at here? Here's, another, here's our example where we see the mass on, um, let's see if I have a movie here. So we see the mass, here's the myocardial tagging. So notice the grid tags, they're not deforming here. So we know that this is not contractile myocardium as we would see in HCM. We see with SSFP or the bright blood cine sequences, we just see thickening of the wall. And you can have HCM look exactly like this. First pass perfusion, maybe very late. We start to see some enhancement there, very, very late. And then this is the key here on the delayed enhancement. Very, very bright, homogeneously bright on delayed enhancement sequences. And that's because the huge amount of collagen that is in these masses. I'll show you one rarer mass. Um, this is a, a, a nice case here. So back to Orlis paper here. So cardiac few chromocytomas, typically epicardial location at the roof of the left atrium or anterior to the aortic root. It's a very characteristic location. They're low attenuation, typically on enhanced CT. They enhance very rapidly. So these tumors, and the one that I'm going to show you, we actually initially thought it was an AVM that enhanced so bright, so much neovascular recruitment, we thought it was actually a, a vascular malformation initially. So they'll enhance as quickly as the myocardium, which is a super low resistance structure. Both octreotide and um, MIBG can show uptake of this mass. The sensitivities are pretty high. FG PET is, is not as good as this. So with octreotide or MIBG are, are much more specific. So here's an example of the case that, that we saw. I'll show you the... So these are nice in that they automatically show up as green. I'm kidding. We had to segment that and make it green. Um, so here if we look at our, this is a maximum intensity projection image as we scroll through the CT. And we see this very avidly enhancing mass. So this is done in an early arterial phase and we're already seeing very bright enhancement. Actually, it might even be brighter than the myocardium at this time point. So very avid enhancement. Right there, it's brighter than the myocardium. And this is super early arterial phase because it's a coronary CT. We still have contrast actually in the RV. Here's the cardiac MR from the case. So here's our first pass perfusion, and you see it light up like a light bulb. So that right there is pretty much diagnostic. If we look at the other images, so here's our SSFP where we see the mass sort of insinuating in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It's a very classic location. Here we have our T1. This is our T1 black blood image. Here's the T2, so homogeneously bright on T2. Then we have our delayed enhancement. And with delayed enhancement, you have to be careful with this mass because the contrast goes in and then it washes out. So in delayed enhancement, you won't see super bright enhancements that we see in the fibroma. So in the fibroma, it goes into that collagen because it's mostly extracellular space it's just going to sit there. The washout rate is very, very slow. Where here the washout is very, very high, so we don't maintain a lot of concentration in GAD at 10 minutes when we do delay enhancement. And then here's an example of the octreotide scan where it lights up like a light bulb, and that's, that's diagnostic. So I'll refer you back to this chart whenever you have a cardiac mass and you're trying to review the different principles and sort out what the tumor you have on your table is doing. And I can email you guys a copy of the PDF of this, or you can just buy Randy's book whenever it comes out. Just to review, we looked at all of the different imaging modalities for looking at cardiac masses. We looked at cardiac CT and cardiac MRI protocols, and then we reviewed some of the more common and uncommon and a couple of rare cardiac masses. Thank you.